welcome everybody. Um, hope you have a, an enjoyable next hour to come. So um, when thinking about digital strategy, I think the first place is to all agree a definition of what a strategy is. So um, I always like the definition that a strategy is a plan that gets us from where we've, what we've been doing, how we've been working to a new way of working, a new way of delivery, which then delivers a big organisational objective or um, aim. So a digital strategy then is how we're going to use, it describes how we're going to use digital tools and um, technologies and in, as enablers to help us improve our performance and again deliver some very um, identified and very clear organisational objectives. There's obviously a whole range of digital tools and I think as fundraisers we can perhaps sometimes be guilty of just thinking about digital communication tools as, as what we mean when we're talking about a digital um, strategy and obviously there's a whole range of those, website, email, all the social media channels but then of course there's a host of other things that fall under the digital um, banner, things like your database, payment platforms, cloud storage and of course all those emerging AI artificial intelligence applications that um, we've all started to get incredibly excited about in the last six months. So use of chatbots, chat GPT, we're now starting to see the emergence of AI um, powered donation platforms. Um, and all of those things can help you raise more money, they can make you be more efficient in how you're working and also help you target more effectively um, the audiences that you want to talk to. So when you first start thinking about digital strategy, it's really important to be clear about what you're, what you're trying to achieve, what the end game is, um, to think about actually what you need to do, who's going to need to be involved, what's the likely income and costs going to be, um, and most importantly, how does that fit in with your organisational strategy and your organisational design? You need to think big because digital can take you to some really interesting new places. However, you do need to ensure you're in step with where um, your organisation is. And this is where the sort of fit to, to organisational design and strategy comes in. And there's, there's three areas here that um, I would suggest that you think about. So the first is to make sure that the objective of your digital strategy really docks in to the overarching organisational strategy. Lots of organisations now have an objective which is around being digital first or digital transformation. And so your digital strategy needs to connect very clearly into that. The second thing is you need to be really clear about where your um, organisation is in terms of its journey to big digital change. So, for example, if your organisation is looking at how it's going to bring all data into one place onto one CRM system, and that's not just fundraising, but delivery data, all their data, all data, then you might have to wait a bit longer than ideal for your fundraising database. However, that doesn't mean that you can't move forward with some other elements of your digital strategy. So, for example, you might be able to implement a new communication channel to reach a new audience or to better target an existing audience that doesn't rely on the CRM. Um, and the third thing is that you need to know the key people across your organisation that are going to be allies on the digital journey and the key working groups so that you can make sure that your fundraising voice is being heard both by the right people and in the right places. It's a case really if you are charged with leading the digital strategy um, for your fundraising team that you've got to be both the project manager um, and the team leader, that, sorry, the cheerleader. Um, I just wanted to finish up by talking about the transformation word because that can feel really big and really scary and some people interpret that as meaning that if I'm going to do digital transformation I've got to implement absolutely everything that is new and available and every time something new happens I need to run towards it. Well that way basically will lie some insanity and it won't help you at all. Um, to be honest, good today is better than perfect tomorrow. Um, and most of the gains that you're making in the digital space are going to be small and incremental. There's very rarely a very big bang moment. So transformation is about a fundamental change in how your organisation approaches its customers, its supporters, how it thinks about business processes, how it thinks about models. It has a big cultural dimension. It's about working differently. But that could be as simple as persuading everybody not to work on spreadsheets <laughs> 
and to put all the data onto the database that you've got. Or it could be just really making sure that your email marketing is working properly and is properly optimised. So it doesn't have to be big, enormous and scary. Lots of small steps will be important on a transformation journey. That's brilliant. Thank you. I'm just going to jump to George, the question that I have for you, because that leads in quite nicely, actually. And Michelle touched on it slightly, but is digital just about shiny new things? You know, if we're going to have to be persuading you know, our board and other key members of staff to kind of invest in digital, instantly people are going to be thinking, oh, that's going to cost a lot. Yeah. Have to be? So I think, um, I think in reality, um, digital is about shiny objects, uh, but it shouldn't be. Um, and so that's often performance related. And so when you're reviewing kind of the, uh, the performance of a particular acquisition channel, be it a more traditional acquisition channel like face to face or direct mail, um, when you're trying to try, when you're trying new things, looking for new supporters, looking for new engagements, um, digital gives you that really powerfully, really, really quickly. But often we see it doesn't get the same level of time, investment, focus, or planning, and it's more kind of we'll have a dabble. It didn't work, so we're going to move on. Um, and so there's Facebook, and then there's Twitter, and then there's TikTok, and then there's Pinterest, and there's all these available channels. And so I think if you don't get one to work, often people, you know, often it's like we're, we're guilty to try and move on quickly uh, to kind of chase the, uh, chase the dream. Um, there are ways around that, though, and you know, I'll, speak, I'll speak a bit more uh, in a minute around planning. But specifically, um, it's about planning for flex. So if something doesn't work immediately, um, go back to the plan. Um, what was the worst case that you were planning for? What's the best case that you were planning for? And, and somewhere in the middle is hopefully where we're going to land. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll unpick that bit more uh, in a moment. OK, thank you. So we know what a strategy is and how we should fit into the organisation. We know it doesn't have to be super sh um, shiny and new things. So, uh, Mike, what clear goals should people be setting when they're kind of developing their strategy and part of the transformation process? What should they be thinking about? When you, look at, when you look at your clear strategy, you've got to have a vision at the start when you're looking. So just to give you a bit of insight, I've, um, we've been working with Wales Air Ambulance Trust now for the past 18 months to uh, digitally transform uh, their processes, the technology. Uh, we started with the new lottery process. But what we started in, at the beginning was we had a governance board in place straight away and we work with them to understand what their objectives was, what their their corporate strategy was, and ultimately what they wanted to gain at the end of it. Um, I think when you look at things like intelligence automation, you start off with a strategy, but don't be afraid to change that strategy as you go along. It doesn't have to be one size fits all. It just depends on where you're working with. Um, getting the, the corporate buy-in from the start, so make sure that uh, when we started with Wales Air Ambulance, we've got an executive sponsor who's the CEO. You can't get any higher than the CEO. She's the one that's going to drive this forward. But making sure you communicate to everybody what the strategy is, and I don't just mean starting at the top, I mean all the way down to the people who do the job day to day, because ultimately you're not looking to replace these people and that's the fear that comes in when you talk around automation and digital strategies am I going to lose my job that's not we, what we look for what we're looking for is to free up time so they can start actively engaging with sponsor uh, with the uh, donors um, and the people that they work with yeah, that's really interesting and Michelle I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about how you can bring some of those key stakeholders on the journey with you into towards digital transformation and what does that good strategy look like that they can buy into? Okay, yeah, absolutely. So um, as far as your stakeholders con are concerned, as, as I said um, earlier on, it's important to know who they are. So spend some time identifying who those people are within your organisation. Make sure they're involved absolutely from the get-go. So don't go to them with something that you've produced, but involve them right from the start, um, ask what they're concerned about, what they're worried about. And then as you are developing your strategy, make sure you're seeking their inputs because they might have a different perspective. They might have a bigger organisational view, which will really help you move your um, strategy along. Once you're into the implementation phase, um, keep them informed as you're moving along. 
of not just the successes, but also the failures, the things that don't work quite as you thought they would and, and what adaptions you're going to make. Um, but do celebrate success with them. So um, obviously it's really, you know, your strategy is aiming to take you to a new place. So don't be afraid, as I say, to celebrate that success with them. Um, in terms of what a good digital strategy looks like, there's a number of components. So um, we've already touched on one of them, which was about really articulating what are you aiming to achieve with this strategy? What is the end goal? What do you want your organisation or your activity to be like when you've finished um, implementation? And then connected to that, a really clear and defined set of objectives with associated actions that are going to move you along from what you're doing now and how you're working now to your new state. Ideally, you have a few quick wins, immediate quick wins, so that the plan comes very quickly to life. A good strategy has senior leadership support, so all your stakeholders are important, but the most senior person is, is really, really critical, whether that's the CEO, as it was in the case at Wales Air Ambulance, or it might be your director, it might be your director of technology, whatever it might be, but to have that senior leadership. Good strategy will have milestones and KPIs so that you can measure how you're getting on, but also so you can adjust off the back of those results if things, as we've said, don't quite go to plan. Um, needs to be developed and owned by those who are going to be responsible for implementing it. So sometimes we're asked to think to write strategies for organisations and we very rarely do that because you need to own it. You People in your organisation who are going to deliver it need to own it. It needs to be understood um, and supported by those who support you need. And the final thing I would say is that if you're writing a digital strategy, make sure it's not full of jargon and phrases that could make a digital immigrant like me, because that's what I am, um, feel a bit stupid. So just check yourself always um, that what you're, what you're talking about, what you're writing about and how you're presenting your strategy is understandable by the most uninformed digital person that you can think of. Thank you. And George, you said before that you're going to unpick a couple of different things as well. So what kind of examples have you seen from organisations? And this is to you as well, Mike, you know, from working with organisations around developing the digital transformation. What are some really good ideas around that? What have they used? How have they done it? What learnings have organisations come away with? Because that's what we all want to know, really, what yeah. doesn't work. So <laughs> could you talk to that a little yeah, bit? Of course. I think just building off that last point, what, a thing that we talk about a lot is um, don't use fluff. Uh, and try and steer clear from uh, away from acronyms and things because if you're having a conversation internally or externally and neither, neither of you know what the other one's talking about, you're not going to progress. Um, but um, just to answer your question, Stacey, um, so we use uh, this, uh, this kind of framework, if you like, which is about budget, burn and buy-in. So when we're talking about budget, it's like how, how much how much budget or income spend have we got for this campaign and what what fundamentally what are the expectations at, um, at the end of it if we're having a dabble or we're having a go in digital there still has to be a set of objectives um, and a set of outcomes at the end so I touched a minute ago on worst expected and best case and for us that gives absolute clarity for every pound we put in we can then look at 15 or 20 different KPIs and work out what's going to come out at, um, at the end um, so just being really crystal clear on budget, where it's going to go, and if things go against you, um, then what's your worst case going to be? Can you stomach that, yes or no? Flip side, um, the best case looks awesome. So um, hopefully that, uh, that encourages um, sign-off uh, for the budget. Um, I think what that also, having a worst expected best, also allows for a degree of flex, uh, flexibility. So for example... Um, one, of, one of the KPIs we have early on in digital that our, our clients use is cost per thousand. Um, something super, super simple like a, like a cost per thousand. I nearly said CPM then, but um, uh, it cost per thousand. Um, but if you start your campaign and you were, you were estimating that was going to be a four pound cost per thousand and it starts at eight, you don't want to then turn off the campaign because your worst expected best should cover you. And if your other KPIs are looking healthy or healthier than expected, then you've still got that degree of flex. So that's budget. Um, burn is, is essentially looking at what tests are you going to are you going to try and learn. You need to spend some degree of money um, on things like uh, reach and awareness. So two years ago, two and a half years ago, we were talking about the need to not have to spend any money whatsoever on brand awareness within digital because uh, platforms like Facebook, 
just totally looked after the performance. We be, I think we became quite lazy in, in our approaches. Um, but now that's very different. And certainly if you're a charity that doesn't have bricks and mortar, you need to invest in, you need to invest in, in awareness. So like, it's like, um, we've heard this term being used a couple of times, paying digital rent almost, um, because that fundamentally is king. Uh, but that costs some money and you're not going to get a direct ROI f uh, from that. So that's, that's the burn bit. And then ultimately it's about buying recurring theme um, from the other two panelists. Um, making sure that people are aware of the plan, um, making sure they're aware that there's a worse expected and best. If you're the budget sign off or if you're the person responsible uh, with spending the money, uh, then everyone needs to know fundamentally where, where you could end up, what, what those cases might be, what uh, tests you're going to uh, undertake, what you're gonna, what you're gonna learn. That's brilliant, thank you. And Mike, so Mike's actually here today on behalf of Northwest Air Ambulance, as he said, um, so, sorry, North Wales Air Ambulance. <laughs> um, because Mark forgot that he was on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, can you talk a bit about um, what you've seen Air Ambulance um, kind of go through, experience? Do you think that they would have done anything differently? Or have it, have, with you saying that you know, they've got the buy-in from the CEO, which is really just the most fantastic thing, has it been quite easy or are there still things that they've learned? You know, what kind of things can you um, talk about that, you know, other organisations here might be able to learn from from that experience? Yeah, so, so I mean, to start off with, um, as we spoke around before, is making sure everybody's aware of what we're doing. And we've worked really closely with the person whose job it was to do the lottery process. Mm -hmm. And we've automated this process for her. But instead of, at the start, she was in fear, am I losing my job was the first thing she said, but that's not what we're there for because I think it's really, really important to stress out there, don't lose that human intelligence. You've got that, you've got to have that human empathy within there when you're working. So what, you, what we do with uh, Wales Air Ambulance, we're removing the mundane repetitive tasks that people were just doing and we're actually freeing them up to work with the donors so they can actually go out there and speak to people try and get more money i mean the situation we're in now with uh, with the the cost of living crisis and people not being a able to afford to to invest in weekly lotteries or whatever we need to go out there and understand what we can do to then get that investment back in because Wales Air Ambulance it's it's about eight million a year that they have to raise to keep the uh, the helicopters in the skies. I think another key take is uh, what we, um, what George mentioned as well, is make sure you get your sign off from everybody from IT and security. They're the first people you need to go and speak to really, because IT are the people that will, will ultimately sign things off and security because you've got all this data that you're, you're, you're playing around with. Um, again, going back to what Michelle said as well, think big but start small get a process up and running and showcase it to the business, to the charity, to show what it's doing. And, and as Michelle said before, celebrate that success by communicating it. Say how well it's done, what benefits. Don't just, we've just automated the process. What's it actually doing? What's the reduction in uh, transactional cost? What's the reduction in time? What it's free enough? Um, another one we've done with Wales Air Ambulance, keeping that human in the loop. Uh, empathy is, is somebody if they decide to cancel the membership so they want the call to go through to a person because they want to understand why they want to cancel mm -hmm. but ultimately if they do they press a button and the digital worker will go ahead and do the next so they're available to, to speak so really important to get that buy-in. Thank you. So George how does one successfully implement and manage the new digital strategy once it's all up and running? Um, well, I think, uh, kind of as I've alluded to before, I think it's um, ensuring that you're sticking to, sticking to your plan. Um, that's, that's got to be the first and funda like the fundamental element. Um, and yeah, and then um, in, you know, in, terms of, in terms of how you're measuring that and reporting on it, um, that's using tools that are readily available to you, um, rather than uh, you know using complicated technology, technology, which is which is often something that that we see um, doesn't need to be living in Excel, uh, but Excel does do a job. Um, but um, I think understanding the data, getting the data to talk, using data to make good decisions, um, and then optimizing. And I think 
why one of the, one of the many reasons we are absolute champions of digital is because digital isn't about putting something into the market and then waiting ten weeks to see what the performance looks like. It's it's on your doorstep. It's every day. It's twenty four seven. And if something doesn't quite work or isn't working quite as you expected, it, you've got the ability to change. Um, so yeah, enabling yourself to use data correctly and make good decisions essentially. And Michelle and Mike, do you have anything to add to that? The only thing I would say is that, that in the digital space, it's sort of never over. So, you know, with, with lots of the sorts of strategies that I used to be involved in writing when I was first a fundraiser, you would get to the end of the strategic period and you'd be able to say, yes, we've done all of that. And it's sort of over. And we used to write strategies over four, four or five years. Digital is much faster and we don't actually know now what's going to be available in five years time. So it needs to be a fairly short time window over which you think about digital transformation um, and what's going to happen. But it's, it sort of never ends. It's going to be a never ending journey, which you will then pass on to, to others as you move to a to different organisations. So that's the piece. It's sort of never over. It's like it's change. Never done. Change is the, is the thing that's a constant, isn't it? Yeah. And it is so true. You've, so true. You've, you've, you've really got to have, when you, when you go in with digitalisation, you've got to have built in within it is a continuous improvement plan because, as Michelle's just stated, technology, what's here today in six months' time, who knows? Who knew ChatGPT was coming along and Bard? Who knows what we're going to be working with? Um, but it, 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 if there's one thing that you can take from it, it's not going away. It's just, just going to increase as we go along. So if you're not on that digital transformation journey now, now's probably the time to start looking at it. And Michelle, earlier on, you mentioned quick wins. And a question to all three of you, really, is what would be a quick win? So, if, you know, if there's many small to medium, large charities in this room. Some of them will have bigger budgets than others. But what could be a really quick win for a reasonable cost? Um, well, I'll go first. I think the quickest win is is to make sure that your current CRM system that you've got is being properly used by everybody, that they're putting the data on, um, that those that are responsible for keeping it clean, if you're lucky enough to have an, in, a, a, an individual or a team who does that, um, is able to do that. But yeah, start with what you've got. Always start with what you've got. You know, you might think, oh, the CRM system doesn't work. Well, likely a new CRM system won't work either because you've You've got to be confident in what you're doing. So, yeah, make sure that you're, what you've got is working, whether that's CRM, whether it's an email marketing program, um, because that, that's, that's the easiest and the quickest way. And if you can demonstrate that, then you'll likely be able to lever the investment into some of the newer, bigger stuff. What about you, Meg? Anything where you've got staff who are just doing repetitive tasks can be quick quick wins. I mean, what we tend to do is we go in and we do, a, we do a workshop to understand the client's processes and then we select a couple of processes to showcase to them as a proof of concept. So I would always suggest possibly going down a proof of concept so that you can do a quick win, turn it around and share that with the, the CEO or the, the key stakeholders. Um, and my, my one would come back to the, the, the spend point again. Um, you know, uh, uh, essentially, we're looking at how can we be the most effective with every pound that we're spending. It's really, it's like really difficult right now from a you know, kind of the pound, everyone's pound is being stretched further and more than ever before. And so um, it, everything's got to work much harder. Um, so I think, I think the two bits for me are looking at, again, what we're measuring. Are we measuring short-term effectiveness or, or long-term effectiveness? Because both of those two things have a different outcome. Um, short term is all about ROI, bang for buck, you know, making, spending today, getting something tomorrow. But long term effectiveness necessarily isn't about, isn't about ROI always. Um, and I think the other one is around, again, this kind of the level of spend. So it's like it's a globally recognised number that you should be spending about 5% of your turnover or your charity income on uh, advertising in order to be effective. If you spend under that or over that, then generally speaking, um, you get diminishing returns. And so if you're at about that 5%, how much of that genuinely is being spent on digital? Because I bet for 90% you know, plus of organisations, it's not getting a fair share. So again, there's, there's, there's lots of studies in, into this, Magic Numbers, PwC, Deloitte, they've, big firms have done lots of research into this. 
Um, and generally speaking, it's like 50 to 60% of your budget should be spent online, 50 to 60% of your budget should be spent offline. So if, if, your, if your percentages are out of kilter, then um, the quick win is to review that. And so we've talked about you know, CRM systems, the things that we've already got. Social media is obviously one of the ways. You mentioned TikTok before and Instagram and those kinds of things. What one thing um, could you, or what have you seen actually as well, are people out there who are using it really well? And what advice would you give to anybody here who's like, you know, attempting to put, dip the toe into the social media waters? Um, you know, what advice could you give around how to do it well? Um, and who else potentially maybe to look at, you know, to kind of look for inspiration around the charity that's doing it really well as well? I, I can start on that one. Um, so I think uh, for us, the, the absolute key channel is Facebook for us. It, it has the, the biggest reach. TikTok is growing massively. Um, and the, the idea, the notion that TikTok's just for youngsters um, is, is in, incorrect now. You know, the, the 30 pluses are one of the largest groups on, uh, the gr largest growing groups on TikTok. So in five and 10 years time, they're going to be um, a perf you know, perfect audience. I think both... Um, I'll, t I'll talk interchangeably about Facebook and TikTok just quickly. I think in terms of the content now, it's not about kissing on the first date in terms of serving ads and getting a conversion. It's about telling a story, generating awareness, building co um, consideration. So this is top of funnel, middle funnel, bottom funnel stuff. Yeah, it, this is stuff that we've been talking about for years, but we just kind of forgot about it in the last couple of years. Um, so it's all coming back. So, um, so yeah, investing at the kind of top and middle and bottom of funnel, um, but also the telling of stories and using user-generated content, so mobile phone, phone content, um, air ambulances, just, just to use um, those guys as an example, do this really, really well. They use um, generated content from mobile phone. They can follow a paramedic to a scene, and that's really, ca that's really engaging, the whole Big Brother thing. Um, so, yeah, I, and then the last one, I think in terms of who's doing it well, um, I'd advocate the use of something like Facebook Ads Library. Um, if you Google that, it's a free tool, and you can see every advertiser's uh, ads that are running currently. And you can use things like, if you're, if you're, if you're running a lottery, you can put in lottery and um, uh, you know, uh, air ambulances or lottery and children's charities um, to give you results for those uh, charities that are running those ads. Um, and then you can do things like little hacks like the, the ads that have been running the longest, that suggests they're probably working. So have a look at that organisation, have a look at what their interests are. Facebook tells you all this because it's public information. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, yeah, cool, cool little hack. Love a hack. <laughs> Any other hacks? <laughs> Any other advice or anyone that you've seen that's doing it well? Um, so my advice on the, on the social media channels is, is to step back and first of all de decide what you're try who you're trying to get to with those channels. Is it your existing audiences or is it some new audiences? And then if it, whichever it is, then look at the channels that they're using. This is not about you thinking, oh, actually, we want to be expert in TikTok or Be Real because we've got somebody in the office who knows how to do that. It's got to be about where the audience that you're trying to get to is very, very active. So uh, for me, I'm going to say this, aren't I? It's a step back and, and basically make sure that you're activating or you're thinking about the right channels for, for your audiences. Um, in terms of people that are doing it well, I know the British Red Cross has been really good on TikTok. The other thing I would say is that when you do start using a channel, make sure that you're speaking and communicating in a way that fits for that channel. So I basically use SMS, instant messaging, WhatsApp, whatever you call it, all the time to talk to my family and friends. If anybody rings me, you know, I think something terrible's happened. And you talk in a particular way on those channels, don't you? So if you suddenly get a charity talking to you in the way that they would talk corporately on their website, it just doesn't work. It just does not work. So it's not only about, it's, it's really about getting into that language and the tone of voice, not your organisations, but what is an, an appropriate adaptation for that channel and will make sense to the person who starts receiving messages from you down it, marketing, advertising. How about you, Mike? Yeah, similar to what George and Michelle have said, it's, it's making sure you've got your audience, but it's also, um, as George said, measuring the results because you need to know which is the, the platform which people are going on. Um, again, just going back to what we said before is if you are going down a social media route, just make sure your security team are involved. Uh, very important because 
people go on, set up accounts on social media. You just need to make sure that you, you're very secure. Okay. And just before we move on to uh, some of the questions, Tracy, how much time have we got left? Because <laughs> I think there's probably going to be quite a lot of questions from the floor as well. Oh, lovely. Okay, we've got loads of time then. Um, so we've spoken a little bit about um, who the best people are to get involved in the strategy. Um, that not to kind of take away the human face and side of things as well. We've talked about thinking big, but start small. Um, celebrating success, um, getting the right language for digital as well. We talk about continuous improvement plans and things like this. And also to be able to measure the impact that it's made. That's quite a lot of information to, to kind of go away with as people who are here probably to learn quite a lot about to do with digital. We're going to ask at the end uh, the panel for a golden nugget for something that everyone can take away. But if you were to give somebody some advice just to say, start with this, where the, should they start? After they've done the strategy, they've thought about what they want to do, they've thought about the audiences and they're ready to go, what should they do? Um, so uh, my lens is supporter acquisition um, and, I'll re and I'll respond to this question from a, a cold acquisition perspective on something like Facebook. Um, the first thing you should do is create a worst expected and best um, forecast. And that is super simple to do. Um, the, the journey between putting an ad in front of um, somebody cold and getting a, a conversion, um, there are you know, well over 15 different stages. There are 15 different KPIs there that you can measure. Um, start where you, with your expected case, punch in some numbers that you think, you know, it might be finger in the air, ask a colleague, ask an agency, Google Revealbot is a, is a really good um, system that we use to get um, global averages on different KPIs and things. That will give you your expected case and then um, yeah, define it up and down from there to get worst, worst and best. I, I would say absolutely, fundamentally, before you spend anything, have, have a web. Okay. Mike, what about you? Um, I would say going back to what George said around budgets is don't think you need to have a massive budget for this. So what we what we done with Wales Air Ambulance is um, it was a small budget, but we started them on the journey and we've trained up three people within the organisation to become developers. They've got no technical expertise because it's low code, no code. Um, so now moving forward, they're developing their own processes. So that's all in house. We just support them. And so they've got their own centre of expertise. And if anybody's thinking around doing and um, starting that journey, just bring in experts at the start, but think around long term and how you can develop your own in house capability. Mm -hmm. and Michelle, do you have anything That's to really add? Do you have anything to add to that? Um, the only thing I would say is make sure you've got a, a realistic project plan, time scale. So, you know, your strategy will be the big picture and it will show the, the long term and the, the bigger objectives. But then break that down into a plan that is day by day, week by week, but also so that everybody's clear what their responsibility is and what their dependencies are. And then you can keep track of, of progress against that plan as well as against actually hitting the, the KPIs. But the, the time thing is, is really critical to know, you know how long or how um, short it's going to be. And how long and how short does it normally last? So, you know, from kind of the beginning, thinking about it, phase to developing the strategy and everything else, what is a realistic time scale for us to be looking at potentially? You know, I imagine some people can do it quite quickly. For others, it's a little bit more long term. I guess it depends on the campaign potentially or what you want to do. I guess it depends on how big and complex your organisation is as well and where they are in their, their journey. So if you're a small organisation, you can move quickly to gather the people that that you need um, to support you and then actually write the strategy. I mean, it doesn't need, we're not talking like pages and pages. The strategy piece should be quite short, succinct and concise, really easy, understandable. So, um, yeah, and, and you, you might have, you might, depending again on your organisation, need to go through different levels of sign-off for things. So, um, ideally, sort of three months, but it can be as long as six or nine, as I say, just depending on the size of your organisation. The thing with the digital strategy is that if you're not moving fast, by the time you get it signed off, it'll actually all have potentially changed. And that's the, that's the, that's the trick, really. So, uh, fast, as fast as you can, but again, understanding what your organisational context and processes are because you don't want to upset people by trampling all over those i think it's, it's, oh sorry go on, <laughs> go on. Yeah, i was just going to add on just to say as well as 
your three to six months is great as well, but just don't forget that continuous improvement, yeah. bit, which can be longer. It's got to be a long term. I think timing for, from our point of view, from a, you know, a campaign delivery perspective, where we used to have campaigns that were two weeks long, they're now two or three months long. Um, so every kind of when it when it comes to the acquisition bit, it's it slows down quite a bit. Um, and I think there are there are a number of reasons for that. But what, one of the reasons is that you're going low and slow, low, low budget, slow approach so that you can see what the moving parts are doing. Um, but also things like Facebook now, certainly our recommendation is once you set a campaign to live, don't touch it for 10 days, seven to 10 days, because you often see a really nice trajectory on a graph with results that are going exactly as you want to, three or four days, and then it starts to fall down. And that's just the learning curve. This bit here is where people then often will turn the campaign off. Um, but if you leave it a couple more days, it then, it then writes itself uh, back up again. So leaving time for the results to come through um, before making any uh, real changes and just and accept that if you want to try and get budget away in two or three weeks and then, then actually that may not be possible. We've spoken quite a bit about um, you know kind of budget um, and I think three to six months is quite a reasonable time it's much quicker than what I thought it would have been but I, I am a Luddite as I've said and maybe I'll start calling myself a digital immigrant because that seems a little bit nicer to, <laughs> a bit nicer to me. Um, but what would be a reasonable return on investment? So I guess this is to, to Mike and George specifically for you know a charity. So if they're going to go away and speak to the you know the chief execs or the board or whoever around you know this is what we can do. It could be three to six months. We could start seeing results in you know whenever. But also, this is how much we could potentially gain. What what would that be potentially? Uh, it can it can be anything. It can be immediate. Mm. Um, we've done a very simple thing with Wales Air Ambulance was. They literally were still posting out letters for new members, so we switched it to email. Uh, that That's saving them 20k a year straight away. And you're seeing that because there, there could be five or 600 letters being sent out. Mm. And just that time back for, for the uh, lottery administrator to be able to, mm. to go out and try and bring in mm. new people. So you can, it can be straight away. It could be over 12 months. I think from, from an ROI perspective, like ultimately, we need to get more back than we put out. That, 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 that's, a fair, that's a fair one. Um, but I think, again, just um, setting expectations on if you're just focused on the short term, mm -hmm. where if you spend a pound and you have to get 101 back minimum, um, that's, that's not really, a, in, in our opinion, that's not really a strategy. Um, so longer term, how, how do you get the longest term the longest, um, most effective ROI over a long period of time. That's that's the conversation. Um, and when we look at like, so when you look at digital, and you know, we, we hear, um, hear hear things like you know, it's not stacking up from an ROI perspective. But if you look at cold DM, you know, cold DM can take two, two, three years to get profitable. And mm -hmm. um, there's there's spend, there's outlay, there's time, there's investment, and eventually the plan comes right because you're learning, testing, learning. Digital is exactly the same. Um, I think I think what's amplifying that point with digital right now is that it didn't used to be like two years ago. You spent a pound and you could get three or four back. Um, but you know, Michelle's point earlier, things are changing all the time. So okay. good to know. So this is seeming really achievable. I feel like I'm going to go back with a little bit more of a positive outlook on digital for sure. So before we go to questions, I'm going to ask each of the panel, um, can you share one golden nugget uh, for people to take away today that they can potentially um, action? And it needs to be relevant for any organisation, no matter what the size. OK, so I'm going to go first on this one. So um, look at what other charities are doing. Look around you. Don't try and solve this all at your desk. Look out and see what other charities are doing and then pick a couple that you um, are really impressed and, and you like the look of it and just track them. See what's happening. See what they're doing in their digital channels. Try and understand what lies behind that. Um, if possible, engage with them. You know, we're really good in the sector and always have been about sharing our learning. So engage and find out how they've got on that journey um, and then make sure that you're bringing your colleagues with you, fundraising, non-fundraising colleagues. But yeah, look up and look out and engage with a couple of organisations that, that you admire. Yeah, that's a good point. From, from an intelligence automation perspective, um, for me, it's making sure you look for a unified workforce 
So digital workers working alongside your human workforce um, and that will lead to a successful story. Um, so I, I would have said that my golden nugget was the Facebook ads library. That is, that is a, a, a tool in your armory for sure. Um, so I'll, I'll build on that a bit more now. Um, I think, um, so, when, so when we design creative for Facebook, we, we have different themes for the imagery and the copy tone of voice. So things like it might be shock, hope, empathy, prize, impact, need, things that you can think about when you're creating an image and, and the text that goes with it that you can easily identify that there's a clear theme there. And when you then run those um, uh, creatives into Facebook, you can then quickly identify that there are winning and losing themes. And the winning theme then becomes, you know, you, it then gets more, more of your concentration as you start to build out. So for example, if it's impact, that's engaging and getting most um, conversions, you know that that particular audience likes to hear, see, engage with impact-driven content from, from your organization. And again, going back, into, going back into Facebook, there's a wealth of examples there where you can start to unpick. But how we use that in our agency is um, looking at yeah, looking at which theme is winning, um, and continuously looking at creative, measuring the effectiveness of creative, going again, recycling, put, putting new new creative in. So uh, yeah, themed creative, I think is probably our our nugget. Brilliant. I hope we've all written that down because I definitely have. <laughs> um, we're going to take to the floor uh, some questions. Uh, we've got a few minutes left, haven't we, Trace? So I'm going to leave my voice away. There you go. Pop the slider up, but um, you know should be better at this. I'm trying to answer the slider ones as well. First one on slider was what are the key KPIs for cold acquisition? Um, I mean, so from a uh, I'll, I'll go for that one. Um, did, from a digital perspective, I, I'd say the first like the first three KPIs of the 15 or 20, dependent on you know how you're using the platform, would be cost per acquisition. Um, uh, sorry, no, not cost per acquisition. Cost per thousand. Um, and click-through rate, um, and then the, the cost that's related to those actions. Um, they, for us, are absolutely key. There is a, there is a school of thought that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be obsessed with cost per thousand, but for us, it, it, you know, if, if you can, for example, if you half your CPM, your, your cost per thousand, in two identical scenarios, if you half your cost per thousand, you'll double your conversions, the number of conversions. So it is, it's a fundamental metric. Um, and you can, get, you can get it right and you can get it wrong. Things that, that drive cost per thousand will be your creative, how relevant your offer is. If you're going to cold people, it sounds a bit shocking, but people don't really care what you're putting in front of them because they're cold. And you're, you're, you know, part, of this job, part of this journey and job that we're all on is creating awareness to warm people up. Um, so um, the audience that you're going to can also define that, uh, the, uh, that cost per thousand amongst others. But. We had one, uh, who had the hand up? Hi guys, so some of the things you mentioned, um, including TikTok, Pinterest, Reddit, these digital platforms that in our charity we really want to use, but we struggle to get through sort of DPIAs and data protection and how they fit with sort of our overall strategy and, and who we are as a charity have you got any advice around getting that sort of team on board yeah it's often i mean it's often very difficult google's exactly the same um and uh, you know so for, from a lottery perspective even dealing with um even dealing with a platform google's is pretty tough um so yeah i mean generally speaking we we signpost to legal support on that um and dependent on what bodies you're, you're involved with. So for example, if you're running a lottery and you're members of the Lotteries Council, I'm just gonna put my vice chair hat on here for the Lotteries Council. Um, if you're members of the Lotteries Council, you get free advice, um, you get 20 minutes free legal advice, for example, on, on matters like this and VAT and things. Um, so you can, you can lean on those bodies. Um, what, what I would say is from a cold acquisition perspective, um, it ultimately, Facebook will, in my opinion, will deliver greater uh, results than pl other platforms like, like that. Generally speaking, it's around intent. So Google, for example, people generally aren't Googling, I want to play the lottery of a heart, heart, lottery, you know, heart charity, for example. 
um, they'll be Googling other stuff and then and then you can you can retarget. So yeah, um, right channels for right uses, I guess. Um, but Michelle, you, you mentioned something um, a while ago about researching uh, researching where supporters hang out. And I think p things like Reddit and Pinterest are awesome to listen, social listen, to what, uh, what groups of people are talking about around certain topics. Um, and out of those conversations, you can get some really good definitions for targeting. Again, target-based um, uh, acquisition on, on Facebook, which despite a lot of chatter around you shouldn't use target-based um, acquisition, I, again, we do and we get results from it. So there's your answer in a roundabout kind of way. We've got lots of questions flying through on Slido. You'd be pleased to know. One here, we've been trying for about a year to use TikTok um, for lead generation with little success. Is it a case of tweaking our strategy and persevering or just um, accepting it's not worth it in our organisation? <laughs> we would someone, take a big breath there. Is someone willing to, ex like, to expand on that a little bit? Whoever wrote that? We, um, sorry to put you on the spot, because it would be really interesting to find out what, what the challenge is. It might be someone online. Yeah. If it's oh, online, OK. Um, so, yeah, I mean, c could you read the question again? And I'll just I'll give you my view on it. We've been trying for about a year to use TikTok for lead generation with little success. Is it a case of persevering and, or, and tweaking the strategy or just accepting it won't work in our organisation? Yeah, so I, I'd almost start by saying that I, I can't believe that um, TikTok wouldn't work for the organisation mm. um, based on the fact that that's a content platform and there's such a diverse, um, you know, there's such diverse content on there. Um, so it, it, may be, it may be something related to the content and approach. Um, I guess it comes back to the plan. What's your expectation? Are you looking for leads or are you looking for conversions? If they're looking for conversions, I would say TikTok's not the platform for that. TikTok is great for building awareness, great for reach, great for telling a story. Um, and then perhaps the, uh, the conversion or the thing that you want people to do after they've engaged with you on TikTok is to go to your website and then you would use retargeting on things like Google and Facebook to then deepen the relationship in middle and bottom of funnel. And then you'd use Facebook to convert them. Um, again, if you're running a lottery, um, you can't run TikTok ads, uh, lottery ads on TikTok. So if that's where they're struggling with from a compliance perspective, it might be something related to that. But um, yeah, TikTok is like Facebook was five years ago. So from a cost perspective, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, but it, it, it has a very specific role. Yeah, um, is this working? Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, nice to hear some Scouse accents on the panel. I thought I was the only person who got lost as well. So, um, <laughs> my, my question is around uh, internal culture. So um, I'm an events manager, ran a campaign last year, and we invested very heavily in social media, um, not just the spend, but, but getting a digital agency to, to support. And it, it's quite difficult to get that investment again, um, mainly because internally... My finance team is very, very ROI driven mm -hmm. and tell me exactly how much money those people made. Tell me exactly where they're going. And the reality is with, with all the sort of privacy around it these days, it's quite difficult to draw a direct correlation between we spent this and short term, we got that. So the, the, the blocker now is on, well, you can't tell me what your, what your result was, so I don't want to invest that money again. Um, so how would you go about, uh, short of just having the same argument again and again and again, how would you go about uh, influencing that? I think the cultural piece is, is, a, is a difficult one and it comes back to, to what we've been sort of saying really as a theme throughout this. It's about getting people on board at the start of the journey. So whilst it's difficult, finance teams do need to understand there's a range of KPIs and measurements that are just not ROI. And as I say, that's easy for me to say because I'm not having the conversation in um, in front of them. It might be worth um, if you can if you can identify any charities that are perhaps for, you said last last year was the first time you'd done it. Yeah. So if you can identify any charities that are further down that journey and have done it three, four, five, six times yeah. and see what metrics they've got. 
that relate to you know the the long term um, financial output from the program and the people that are coming on board because I think it was George said but it is a it is a long term game once you've got them on it's you know with with any fundraising it's not just digital channels they come on for a specific action but then it's about keeping them and retaining them and, and um, building their lifetime value so I would suggest actually looking for some other organisations that are further on and seeing if they will talk to you and share some metrics with you but yeah I mean anybody who has hasn't yet done it. It just really sort of confirms what we've been saying about making sure that everybody's on board and, and understand the, the sort of lens through which these things have to be judged and monitored. And it, it can't be solely, solely um, ROI, particularly when you're in a sort of test and learn phase, yeah. which you are. Unfortunately, though, a finance director will only look at ROI and what cost and what numbers are coming in. Probably just take what operationally, what what benefits you've got from the operations as well and communicate that because um, there's all different service areas involved. We have the same issue if we go out to to do a project. We have to um, account for every penny we spend with our finance director, but ultimately some of them aren't around what uh, monetary value are coming. It's more around what it does operationally, which adds the weight to it. I, I think that sounds like a classic case of short short termism, mm. for sure. Um, and I, like you mentioned culturally, there, I think that's a really key point. Um, if you're expected to deliver something uh, and you get beaten up for it because it didn't work, uh, you're going to be reluctant to test that channel again. And there are lots of organisations who are killing it with events digitally. Um, so to Michelle's point, you know, look at peers who are running running um, similar similar type of activity. Um, and then again, um, I, I'm pushing the web, having a worst expected best, what, what were the good stories in there? So some of the KPIs didn't hit plan, but some did, or you overachieved certain other elements. Um, there, there's, there's, there are also kind of less, less tangible things like feedback, supporter reach, other metrics that you could consider. Um, but I think it yeah, comes back down to get, uh, getting buy-in so that everyone's under the same understanding as to what, what, you, what you're aiming for and, and where you may land. Or, or ask ChatGPT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hiya. Um, I just had a question around like sort of acquisition and retention and sort of bringing people on a journey, I guess. So what... Oh. Hello. <laughs> um, so we, I'm doing a, a raffle, and um, for our acquisition, we tend to do like cold DM um, and Facebook, and then for our warm, we use like warm DM and email. And for those that come on on a digital channel like Facebook, how do you bring them on a journey? I guess because they're not going to be necessarily suited to direct mail, um, but then you just put them on your email list. Like, what is the best journey for them? I suppose. I think um, I think with cold raffle for um, for sure um, that the, the notion of a journey is absolutely key. So it's something like average eight eight to ten pounds CPA cost per acquisition for a, a cold raffler, and they're going to probably give you on, on average eleven pounds for the first time. So if you wash your face on the first campaign, you're in a, a pretty good position, but but you may not. And so that journey bit, the bit crossing over to get to the next raffle, is absolutely key. Um, and so thinking about what the next action is um, and the fact that when we use uh, things like Facebook and get a new supporter, we shouldn't then just completely leave them alone. We don't want to not remind them that we're, that we're here um, and that they can support the cause. Um, so just like for, for, from our, our point of view, we use a, a, supporter, um, a, a supporter value journey that looks at different activities per stage of their life cycle. Ultimately, we want to get them to legacy, for example. How do we get them to that point over time? And uh, that might be that they play three or four raffles or they do another activity. If they've come on via digital, um, are, we, are we offering... I mean, there are still examples where organisations require supporters to download a, a PDF, print it out, fill it in and post it back. <laughs> you know, the supporter journey there is to put them, put them online consider subscription raffle, for example, so they don't have to keep on um, entering their details. Um, so, yeah, um, definitely have a journey. Um, there's one here. 
how do you effectively explore new channels without committing significant resources? Shall I go on? Yeah. 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 So I think um, effectively exploring uh, new channels is thinking about what, what budget you, you can allocate and again, what you're likely to get out of any particular channel. Um, so going back to you know, channels like Pinterest and Reddit, uh, Twitter, in order to get support, you know, brand new supporters out of those channels is incredibly difficult. Um, and that is a, again, I think that they are channels for shiny object syndrome, where it's kind of what we're doing over here isn't quite working, so we're going to test something else. But I think ultimately it comes down to spending enough. So just, just looking at Facebook, I'd argue that um, as a collective, we're not all uh, getting getting behind Facebook quite enough in terms of how, how we're using the how we're using it. And um, again, we, we have conversations, early stage conversations with, with organisations who are looking to invest in Facebook. They've got a new product um, and they're going to spend three hundred pounds on Facebook. That just simply isn't enough. Mm. Um, they're, they're probably spending twenty or a hundred times more than that on other channels. So um, budget budget effectively um, and don't dabble. I'd say to that one. Have we got any more in the room? I've got a couple left on slider, but I didn't just want it to be me reading them out. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. So well, I've now me. probably aimed at George. Yeah. So George, where you're talking around, and, and quite a few questions have come around how you bring new donors in. How do you how do you interact with your existing donors who are constantly putting money towards it? Michelle, do you want to? Do you, do you mean how do you talk about them, talk yeah, to them so, digitally? So, so, yeah, so somebody signed up to a lottery process. Yeah. They've given, they've signed up, they're paying the weekly subscription. Yeah. How do you make sure that you're not just focusing on the new, bringing new members in, right, but also okay. your existing yeah. members to make sure that they Well, kept? absolutely critical. It always has been. It's much easier to hold on to an existing donor than cheaper than um, recruiting a new one. So it comes back to actually what George was saying about the journeys. It's the defined journey. So there's one journey that you might want to put somebody on once they first come on board with you. But as that relationship lengthens, it's having, um, developing their relationship with you by bringing different elements into that journey, maybe offering them um, other activities they can do, giving them more information about what your charity is delivering. But it's absolutely critical that you invest in that stewardship piece and that ongoing upgrade um, of, of ask and, and, as I say, cross-sell as it is to, to acquire new people because otherwise you've got no net gain. You know, if you're, if you're losing as many or as more than you're actually um, acquiring, then, you know, you're, you're getting your nowhere, you're stand, standing still. So, yeah, that stewardship piece is really, really important and it comes back to journey. It's cheaper potentially than the acquisition piece, exactly. but it's of equal, equal importance for sure. I think for, um, from a stewardship perspective for us, we really just focus on the first eight weeks. That is the danger zone, that's the red zone when you're going to lose a supporter. And, and I think it's often really easy to look at, like we need to define a plan that spans 12 months or 24 months cross channel, really complex. Back to the original point about keeping it simple and focus on a particular time, time frame. You can also measure that with stewardship that is in place uh, or that you've put in place and that isn't in place to see the effectiveness of that. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, pretty key. Yeah. 